Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and well, it's the long-awaited birth story of Sarah Ingham. Yes, it's that exciting. We couldn't sleep last night for waiting for this moment for her to tell us exactly how she managed to survive through something that everybody, that many women survive through every single day. But Sarah's going to tell us because it's unique to her. And uh, let's get into it because there's some interesting stuff. Trust me. Finally, finally getting around to doing the birth story. Just how self-absorbed do you need to be to be to actually think that other people want to hear your particular birth story? You know, I get that it is um, something that's yours and um, close to your heart, and you might like to tell people, you know, close friends and things like that. But how 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 does one get to a point where you need to tell people on the internet? And think that they want to know. It just baffles me. My birth experience with little Aurora, baby number six. Good evening everyone, welcome to today's video. As I just said, I'm finally getting around to filming a little sit down, chitty chatty video about my birth experience, a few questions you guys have been asking, how I'm recovering post C-section, how I'm feeling about having my tubes tied, and a whole bunch of questions basically and just I haven't planned anything I've got no like points on what I want to speak on I've got no I've not thought about this at all I'm basically just sitting down and we're just going to chat through it together um very very quick back story I've had natural deliveries with all five of my children and then I needed a c-section with Aurora due to a cyst that was causing a few medical issues which meant it would have been in my eyes, less stressful and less worrying to have a cesarean section. So, first I think I'm at, I really should do pinpoints because otherwise I start waffling in a jumbled up order, but there we go. So once I'd made the decision, decision to have the cesarean section with Aurora, I felt so much better. I genuinely felt like a massive weight had been lifted. I could stop worrying about everything and I kind of knew that I knew how my labour was going to be. Obviously, you get a date given, and my date was given for 39 weeks and five days. That made me a little bit anxious, not gonna lie, because baby number five, Mila, she was born before that, naturally. So I was a bit worried, but thankfully, baby girl stayed put. And on the 11th of October, me and Chris headed into the hospital. Not to be the grammar police or anything, you know, but... Uh... I, I feel it's important, since you are homeschooling your girls, that uh, it's Chris and I, or Chris and me, it's not me and Chris. So, to have my scheduled caesarean section. Now, overall, <clears throat> people keep saying, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer the natural delivery, or do you prefer having a caesarean? I genuinely can't answer. I feel like most people have an answer for that, like I definitely preferred the caesarean or I definitely preferred the natural. I genuinely can't answer that question because I, I found them both equally as painful. I'd say I found them both equally as painful and both equally as beautiful except it was kind of in the opposite direction, <laughs> opposite. So for example, when you have a natural delivery, you get the pain right away through contractions and delivering your baby. And then you get the beautifulness of having your baby. Whereas with a cesarean section, you get the beautifulness first. So you get the beautifulness of having your baby and then you get the pain afterwards. See, it worries me when you keep saying the word beautifulness of having a baby when you don't seem to actually care about your kids i'm just saying that it's just it feels disingenuous right so i don't feel like anyone's easier or better than the other one i just feel like they're the opposite so it's easier to give birth naturally after like post delivery but it's very difficult when you're actually in labour. And then the opposite side, it's very easy to give birth via caesarean because you're numb and you're just laid on the bed. But then afterwards, the delivery is difficult. So for me, the caesarean recovery was kind of harder and easier than I was expecting. Harder in the respect that those first 
five days, I'd say, the first five days after giving birth, they were hard. They were much harder than I expected. I was in way more pain than I expected I would be. Of course, Sarah, because you thought that having major surgery would be a walk in the park. You'd just get up and you'd, you know, you'd be able to go away on your little holidays the next day and stuff, wouldn't you? Literally, I, I, like I struggled to get off of the bed and go to the toilet, which is why I spent four days in hospital. I don't know how women were standing up and leaving hospital 24 hours later. I don't understand because I genuinely couldn't do it. I barely could get to the toilet. I was crouched right over. I was tiptoeing. I was walking so slowly and it felt like I was trying to climb Mount Everest, just trying to go to the toilet after having her. So how women were just standing up and, and walking out is just absolutely crazy to me. However, after five days, this is where I, I, quite, I was quite surprised because I did panic at first. I was like, oh my gosh, is this how bad it's going to be for like 12 weeks? People say your recovery can take 12 weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks. Is this how bad it's going to be? However, after five days, literally five days, I'd say between day five and 10. So between day five and 10, I pretty much felt back to normal. I, I feel like my recovery was, whilst it was really bad to start with, it I turned a corner very quickly. I know some people say like, you know, it took me like three or four weeks to start feeling better. And after five days, I was starting to feel better. Come on guys, let's give Sarah Ingham a round of applause because not only is she better than everybody else at everything she ever did, she is, her recovery time was so much quicker. Everybody else, oh, they had three or four weeks of recovery, but me, no, we had five days, and then I was feeling perfect again. Perfect, guys, perfect. No wonder she felt the need to come on and tell us her birth story, because it is unique, absolutely unique. And by day 10, I felt like I was completely back to normal. Like, I was running up the steps, I was going out for days out, and I just felt really good in myself very quickly. So that, that's, that's one really good thing. I did recover really quickly. I'm day, week, I should say week now. I'm uh, five weeks today. It's been five weeks and I feel completely back to normal. Like I just feel like my normal self. So the recovery for me was hard in the first few days, but very, very quickly felt good again and back to normal. On the actual day of the cesarean section, I know we did vlog this, so you guys have seen a lot of what happened. Um, there's a few things that we didn't film. N nothing, nothing went wrong, or there was no reason why we didn't film it. Basically, we just um, were just in the moment. But the only time I felt anxious during the actual cesarean section was when I was in the room and they were preparing me for the cesarean. Number one, when I walked into the room, there was way more people than I expected. There was literally like 10 people in there. And I don't know why, but I was just expecting maybe a surgeon and one other person to grab the baby as he passed her out. I don't know why I was expecting that. I've not had surgery before, so I wasn't aware of what happened. But there was literally like 10 people in the room and they're all introducing themselves. I'm, you know, I'm the surgeon, I'm his assistant, I'm this, I'm their assistant. I, like every person seemed to be like them and then their assistant. The only really time I felt anxious though was when they were inserting my cannula. I know I've said before and I know I did some of the vlog that I am very hard to cannulate. My veins are very small. Yep, the teeniest, tiniest veins you ever did see, guys. And they, I, I always have so much trouble being cannulated. And this surgeon was like, I'm, I'm really good at it. You know, it's not the surgeon, the anaesthetist, sorry. He was like, you know, it's what I do. I'm very good at it. Don't worry. I, they put cream on my hand, bless them, <laughs> because I was like, I'm really scared. Um, and he got the cannula in my left hand straight away. First time the cannula went straight in and I was so chuffed. I was like, oh, I can't believe it. The cream at the initial site worked. I swear I think my cannulas are so painful because my veins are so small and the cannula they're trying to use is too big. Anyway, he, the initial sight going in was not painful at all because I had the cream on, but as he was going up the vein, it was really tender. But it was done and I was happy. I was like, it's okay, I can cope, it's done. And then he got his ass assistant to put some like saline in to flush it through just to make sure it was all... I can't even talk about this because it makes me feel so queasy. Like my stomach's rolling just talking about it. But he got her to flush it, flush the cannula. And as she did it, 
As she flushed it through, this big bubble on my hand, it just swelled here. Oh, it's so disgusting to talk about. But basically, it was obviously not in correctly. And so the big, big syringe of fluid, saline she just flushed through, instead of just flushing through the vein, it collected in one spot here. And it was just this big swollen, boggy swelling. It was absolutely disgusting. And I'm not gonna lie, at that moment, I was, I had a bit of a panic. I was like, oh my gosh, oh, I couldn't even look at it, it was disgusting. They were like, don't panic, it's fine, don't panic. And it, it wasn't a big deal, it was only a bit of fluid, it wasn't a big deal. But it just, I don't know why, it just turned me so sick, my stomach started turning, I was like, suddenly started having a pan not a panic attack, or anything like that. I was just suddenly like, this is a bit scary. I started shaking a bit, I started panicking a little bit, but they were like, it's fine, don't worry. And then his assistant was like, what do I do, what do I do? And then he said, just massage it, just rub it like this, massage it, and it'll go back down. And I was sat there, I was sat there cringing so bad. Um, but that was the only part of the cesarean that I felt really like, oh, this is not good. Um, when they were actually doing the cesarean, there was a lot more pulling it. You guys told me it's like a washing machine. One thing I don't think I was quite prepared for was the feeling of someone pushing their whole body weight onto me, and I'm not sure what they were doing in their moments, but it felt like he was literally pushing his whole body weight onto my stomach to push. Um, and But that was the only time during the whole process, those two times, where I felt a little bit like, ooh, what's going on here? But yeah, I've recovered really, really well, like I said before. My scar, I've had absolutely no problems with whatsoever. There's been no like infection or pain or tenderness. Sometimes I, I did feel like in the first few, well, it still does it now actually sometimes. If I overdo it, <clears throat> if I'm like walking around a lot, if I, if. Fortunately though, Sarah, you're as lazy as they come and you don't generally walk around and overdo things ever. So you, you're good to go, right? Just sit on one of your 10 sofas, you'll be fine. If, if I've had like a really busy day where I've been out all day or sometimes it gets sore and it's really hard to explain because it's not sore on the outside, kind of feels sore on the inside um, and it has actually gone red on the outside a couple of times but it's it feels like a stingy, it's like a sting hurt, not like a, like a throb or anything like that, it's more like, a, like a, a sting but it felt like a sting from the inside so I was like my stitches are hurting but not on the outside, kind of on the inside. Um, but they're healing really well. I've had no type of infection, no real soreness, just on normal, regular, daily basis. And you can barely see it. Like, it's insane. It's so small. Well, it's, it's, it's not massive at all. But it kind of looks like when you've lent on something and it just goes a bit pink. It's just amazing how they can do such a big thing and then just make it look like pretty much nothing's happened. Chris just came in and reminded me of a couple of things because I genuinely have brain fog at the minute. Like, I don't feel like... What was that? Uh. <laughs> Isla. Um, I don't feel like I've ever had brain fog with any other children like I've got with this one. Like, I'm, I actually got a bit of health anxiety about it because it's really bad. But Chris just reminded me of a couple of things that I'd forgotten about initial, initially. Also, whilst I was, whilst I was in the theatre room and they were trying to get the spinal in my back I kept having this horrible electric shock feeling I know that some people say it can go down your leg it kind of went like down my leg a little bit but it was right in my back and it felt like someone was literally put like putting live wires on a nerve in my back it was like the most horrendous like jolty oh oh um and it was just so weird and it was a horrible feeling and he kept stopping and saying, is it doing it now? And I'm like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, he's still doing it. Um, and then I think he said he needed to put extra fluid in. He was like, I need to put more in because obviously it's not working in the way it should do. And I think because they put so much in, no, I don't think this was a reason of them putting so much in. I think this would have happened even if I'd just, have just had the initial bit. But... Afterwards, I had like a big reaction to it where I was itching so bad. It was horrendous. It, I was, it, I can't explain this itching and it lasted for like a whole day, a whole 24 hours, maybe even into 48 hours. 
and it was the wor it was probably the worst part for me to be honest because there is that there was just nothing I could do to stop this itching and part of the places I was itchy like some parts of my back I couldn't even reach and get to and I found that really really difficult so that's one thing to expect maybe if anybody's looking to have a cesarean section the itching was just absolutely horrendous and another thing that I found really difficult post delivery as well was if you're choosing to breastfeed it's very hard to get your baby in and out of their crib it's very hard to push yourself up it's very hard to have them on you whilst you're recovering from a cesarean I really did struggle in the which is why I stayed in hospital for the four days because it's it's it is really difficult and I found the beds in the hospital that you could push them to sit up lower them to the floor make them a bit higher I found all that really really helpful but that's another thing I wasn't quite expecting especially straight after having her when she wanted feeding and I was completely numb like the numbness lasted a long time with me I was, I was in bed for like at least 18 hours before I got out and went to the toilet because my legs were just completely numb and it was really hard to push myself up and get into a position that I was able to breastfeed her which is why I think I suffered with a really bad um, sore nipple, like broken nipples basically. <laughs> broken nipples, okay Sarah, I've got so many images in my head honestly. <laughs> Maybe you could have got Chris to fix those broken nipples for you. Um, I, on a serious note, I know she's talking in, in in the context of breastfeeding, but anybody else gag a little bit thinking about Sarah's actual nipples? I don't think that uh, that should be a thought that goes through somebody's head whilst they're watching uh, one of a family vloggers, um, you know, vlog. It's just... I, I don't know. By the way, there wasn't any sort of warning at the beginning of this video for kids, whether or not they wanted to watch it, you know, to tell them not to watch it because there's talk, talk of certain subjects, but they didn't do that. Especially on my left side, like it, it was cut the whole way around for like the first two weeks of her life, something like that. And I'm sure it was because that first two days in hospital, I couldn't get her on properly because I couldn't move. Um, so that's obviously another thing to bear in mind as well. And then finally, just with my experience of a caesarean, I think this is finally, unless I forgot anything else. But finally, whilst now I'm feeling great and fully recovered, pretty much back to normal, my left butt cheek <laughs> is numb still. Totally numb. Uh, it's kind of like on the bottom of my back it's like a space probably as big as the palm of my hand um it's kind of like at the bottom of my back slash top of my bum and it's the hor most horrible feeling ever so it's numb but when i say it's numb i don't mean it's numb so i just don't notice it it's numb so when i touch it lightly i can't feel anything but i always get itch there so you know like when you get an itch but when I try to scratch it and itch it, it doesn't give you the, you know, when you get like it's nice and a nice pleasure when you itch yourself. It's not like it hurts. <laughs> I don't even know what to say, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. The pleasure you get when you scratch your butt cheek. I'm sorry, but you're asking for so many comments. Comment down below if you uh, have the same pleasure non pleasure ratio that Sarah has when scratching butt cheeks. So when I try and scratch it, if it itches, it like it's like I'm touching raw nerve or something, and it actually hurts. Um, and when like Chris, because Chris always like rubs my back or you know, he'll come up to me and rub it, and I'm like, no, don't rub it there. It's the most horrendous feeling. It's not a big deal, and I'm sure over time it'll probably get better, but I wasn't expecting, like, five weeks later to still have a palm-sized patch on my back that was feeling like that. Um, this seating position is really good for vlogging because there's light over here, and it's really nice. <laughs> it's really calm and nice, but sat on the floor gives me pins and needles so bad. Right. So I've been asked this question quite a lot. I know lots of you guys are interested and wondering how I'm feeling on this side of things. So I thought I'd quickly 
touch upon it here. I'm not going into detail because it's very private to me. It's very raw still. I get very emotional when I talk about it. So I'm only going to step on it, basically. So it's very private to you and you don't want to share too much of it. Shame you didn't have the same thought process when uh, sharing all the intimate details of all your kids' lives, you know. But they didn't get that option, did they? Because, no, I mean, for those that think that the kids could opt out at any time, you know, Try asking a newborn or a two-year-old whether or not they want to be shared with thousands of people online. See what they say. Tiptoe onto it. When I had my cesarean section, we decided that I would have my tube side because I have a husband who is a little wuss and won't have a snip vasectomy. <laughs> <Isn't Yeah. that? laughs> we decided... Um, whilst I was having a cesarean, it would be easy for me to just have my tubes tied. Now, I'm just gonna very quickly say that I feel like I made the wrong decision doing that. I feel like no women should be able to make that choice. I understand it might work for some women, but I do feel like in such a vulnerable, high hormonal moment in your life, it's difficult to make a decision like that and not regret it. Whilst this may be very true, you did have months, I think nine months, in fact, to make this decision. The fact that you, um, you know, only thought about it at the last minute because of this cyst thing is not really the, the problem. The problem is that you could have talked it over with Chris and decided it amongst yourselves, the pros and the cons, done a bit of research, use Google, you know, you like to use Google, and, you know, come to a, a reasonable decision. Or not feel differently at some point about it. I just don't feel like, because having your tubes tied is such a minor surgery, I feel like it's something that shouldn't be offered during a cesarean section due to my own personal experience. And I know I know that lots of you guys have also reached out when I touched up about this straight after birth, saying you felt exactly the same and you agree that this is probably not something that should be done during a cesarean section. When a woman's already so vulnerable, her emotions are all over the place, she doesn't know how she's gonna feel maybe in six weeks time. And it's such a big life-changing decision that I feel like you should have a completely clear head when you make this decision and um, that's just my personal view i know lots of you guys agree with that as well and there's probably some that don't agree and that you had your tubes tied tied jonas cesarean and you don't regret it one bit and it was easy because you got it done all in one me personally i found out maybe 10 days before i had my cesarean that i was having a cesarean so all of my decisions were made very quickly Again, I would say this was 100% on you though, Sarah. And to say that you found out 10 days before that you were going to have one, right? You didn't find out you were going to have one. You decided to have one. Remember, it was a selective cesarean section. It was your decision. You didn't have to have one. It wasn't essential in order to give birth. You wanted to. So to say that you only had 10 days in order to decide things and it felt rushed is what you're basically saying. But you still could have looked things through, asked Chris, Chris could have uh, helped you with this decision, but no, um, it, I sense that Chris probably thought it was a better option because he didn't have to have the snip himself. So it was kind of a selfish decision. I 100% guarantee it was on his part. And obviously at the time I felt like it was the right decision for us as a family, but I'd be lying if I didn't say and admit to saying I did feel influenced heavily from outsiders and I know I should never ever do that and I'm I, w I felt really angry at myself for a few weeks after having Aurora for letting anybody's decision that's not myself or Chris influence or my children influence such a life-changing decision who are these people that are influencing you Sarah though <laughs> I don't I don't understand I haven't seen anybody that said Oh, Sarah, you need you you need to have your tubes tied, and you need to not have any more children. And nobody's saying that. And even if they were, you you wouldn't be swayed by that. I mean, if you were 
able to be swayed by simple suggestions, then, you know, Jace would have had his hair cut months ago. But it hasn't happened because you've always said you don't let other people decide what you want to do. So who has actually helped you with this decision? Because nobody pays for my children except me and Chris. Nobody has... Oh, I beg to differ, Sarah. I beg to differ. You think you and Chris pay for your children? Absolutely not. Your children pay for your children. They always have done. Every single penny that you own, every single penny that you've ever earned, every single penny that's gone into that house and the holidays and the trips away and everything else, every single penny was made by your children. It's their money. They're paying for you in actual fact. You know what a turn up for the books that is. Responsibilities for my children to look after them, to have them overnight, to babysit, except me and Chris. In fact, me and Chris have our children 365 days a year and have done since they were born. See, Sarah, I know that you think that this is like um, a flex on your part, but it's really not the flex that you think it is to say that your kids have been with you 365 days of the year every single day since they were born. Yeah, whilst, you know, that's lovely that you think you take care of them. But most kids at least get a break from their parents. You know, they go away, they go on school trips, they go on holidays, they even go on holidays with friends, you know. I used to do that when I was young. I used to go on school trips. Or, well, I used to go on trips with friends. My, um, my brothers used to go on holidays with friends. You know, but your kids, they're with you 365 days of the year every single year yeah it's not it's not a good thing so i'm sorry it's not they go nowhere and they have yep exactly they go nowhere they're with you all the time they go nowhere and uh, sarah thinks that it's it's um that's her saying that she is the one that looks after the, her kids and cares for her kids but it's not it's not the She's just saying that her kids go nowhere, ever. And that's true. We don't rely on anybody to have them, ever. Um, so there really is no reason why anybody, anybody at all, should be giving negative opinions on any aspect of mine and Chris's parenting decisions. And this is where things get slightly lost in translation because I get quite a lot of like IFAM and things come over and say, well, why, why, why do you think you have the right to give opinions on their parenting, right? But it's not just about their parenting skills. It's about exploiting their kids. And for that, I don't feel like just being a parent means that you're, you're, you're allowed to exploit your kids just because you, you own them. That's what they think. They own their kids so they can do what they like with them. And I feel really angry that I did let people influence my decision and I feel like maybe that's slightly even part of why I regretted it so badly in those first couple of weeks and why I was so emotional obviously hormones did play a big part as well but yeah basically so if you guys watched that vlog which I know most of you will have done you'll know exactly how I felt and whilst my emotions right now are not quite as raw as they were then, obviously we're five weeks later, I still do feel the same like I did um, then. I still regret doing it. I still have regrets. Um, in, was it like the day after, <laughs> it was like the day I got home, you called those clinics, wasn't it? Oh yes, I'm sure Chris couldn't wait to call around clinics to find out whether or not you can you know, get the the operation reversed because he is um he's keen to get this sorted out so possibly maybe there's another chance of another baby coming along. So the day after I got home I felt so bad I literally cried for like well I cried solid for like three days, right? Oh, 
Yeah, yeah. but I mean like proper cried most of the, a lot of the day for like mm. three days. And then I, th I do kind of feel like they was a part of that were my hormones and part of that was how I was feeling. But then after that, I'd like, I still cry like once a day for like a week or something. But I'm, I'm not, cr but then since then I haven't cried at all about it. But just because I've not cried about it, I still have that feeling there when I think about it, which is why I don't think about it. It's stu it's stupid to think about right now because I don't know if this sounds crazy, but when I think about it, I feel like I have to give myself a decision. So when I start thinking, I, I kind of go into this panic mode where I need to make a decision right now and I need to decide what I'm doing and I need to a plan and I need to all of these stupid things that actually I don't need to think about right now I don't need to plan anything right now I don't need to decide anything or make any answer any questions or anything like that Aurora's only five weeks old and even if I still felt like this nothing would be acted on I, I wouldn't want another child basically is what I'm saying for at least 12 18 24 months so why at five weeks old do I need to torture myself thinking about it right now um which I found very healing thinking about it this way basically so in the first couple of days after I came home from hospital I was feeling so bad that Chris called around about five different clinics to ask to speak to specialists basically let me move you back because I've got really bad pins and needles and I need to sit up to speak to specialists in the obviously you can't have a reversal done on the NHS it has to be done privately and Chris spoke to five highly recommended clinics in the UK basically and then there was one clinic that was like the best so we're not just looking at the best reviews for like the clinic's best reviews we were looking at like the best reviews for tubal reversal success rates I know saying this out loud to some of you guys you're gonna be like are you crazy like are you actually crazy and I don't know <laughs> Even if having the reversal is because I need to feel like I've got the choice back, I don't even feel like it's because I, I have a desperate need for another baby. I, do, I don't think that's the reason. It's more that I need to reverse a decision I made based on other people's opinions. So let me get this straight, Sarah. You want to... Um... You want to spend five and a half grand on an operation to reverse a decision, not because you may want another child. No, it's, it's because you don't want people to have won, basically. You don't want people to have uh, made the decision for you, so you want to get it reversed. And it's not at all because you want another child, and that's a little bit silly. On my own body. So I feel like I've damaged my own body to please other people, and I need to reverse that. What the actual hell are you going on about? You did not do this to please other people, okay? Stop trying to blame everybody else except for yourself for this decision that you made. Nobody was there with you at the time when you got it done. Nobody forced you to do it unless it was Chris. You know, nobody forced you to do it. And for you to say, oh, well, I've damaged my body to please other people is very manipulative on your part. I'm sorry, Sarah, but just no. That's where I'm at with it at the minute. Um, so we called around all these clinics. We got a consultation booked for like two weeks later. And that's, that's when I started to feel better, basically. Knowing that I had the choice back, knowing that I had the hope back, knowing that someone was gonna help me. And the guys were, all of the clinics that we spoke to were all like, you know, the success rate is very, very high because of your age, because it's only just been done, because of the tubal reversal that I had done. Um, there's different ways to tie your tubes basically clips and burning them and tying them and basically the one that I had done is the easiest one to reverse blah 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 now we ended up cancelling that consultation because I actually didn't feel ready so you made the appointment uh, because you needed to, to you know to try and feel better but it, you ended up not having the appointment you cancelled it in the end <laughs> I can't believe you cancelled it you were so worried about things and then you just decided to cancel it because you started feeling better. I just, I'm, I'm literally feeling more stupid for listening to you, Sarah. To go and it felt like it was too soon and I kind of just wanted to put it out in my head for the reasons that I said before. Like, why am I rushing into this right now? 
when I've only got like a three week old baby when I should just be enjoying her. But knowing that I have that appointment there just made me, made me feel good. But my feelings on it now um, are still pretty much the same. However, I'm not putting any pressure on myself. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying Aurora, my baby girl. And I'm just going to wait and see, basically. I know I have the option to have the reversal done if I want it doing. Sarah, I'm really struggling to understand here, you know. So the whole point of you feeling better is the fact that you know that it's a possibility and an option. You can just get it done when you want to get it done, right? But the the clinics themselves said you're in a good position to get it done and a, a high success rate is possible because you've only just got it done. But do you realize the longer you leave that, the less chance there is of getting it, you know, successful do you, do you understand that particular point of view? It's not just that you'll just walk into a clinic and they'll just sort it out and they'll get it done, you know? It, that's not how it works. Um, it is quite an expensive procedure. How much was it? Was it like 5,500? Something like that. So aside from the fact that there's absolutely no need whatsoever to flex how much it's going to cost you, uh, five and a half grand, you know, but it is quite a lot of money, as I mentioned before, to... Um, <laughs> to get a procedure done just to reverse a decision that you feel was to please other people and that uh, not because you want another baby so you would pay five and a half grand um, if you didn't want to have another baby <laughs> just the mind boggles the mind boggles and I do feel so lucky that we are lucky enough to be in a position to be able to do that because I know there's so many, like I was saying to Chris, imagine if I'd have done this 10 years ago when we would definitely not have been in a position to be able to pay for a reversal. That, and I don't know if I'd have got through those, those early days not knowing that I had an, an, a positive outcome that could come of it, like a, a solution. Because honestly, it's the only thing that, as soon as I had that solution, as soon as I was told I had this solution and I could do this and Chris was reassuring me, stop worrying about it, you've got this solution. And I kept saying, like, I feel like I've made the biggest mistake of my life. And he kept saying, no, you haven't. You made this decision and you had to make this decision and everything happens for a reason. And you made this decision to show yourself what really matters and what's important. Um, and there is a solution. It's not the end. There is a solution to it. And as soon as I felt like that, every, th those big, massive, strong emotions I was feeling disappeared. I would reiterate though Sarah that the I think the the sooner you get it done it sounds like it's a not time limited thing but by them saying that because it's a recent operation that you've had done that it would be a more successful if you did it now you know if you the longer you leave it the less chance there, are, it, there is of success so i i feel like you need to weigh those options up and possibly you know get cracking you know not that i'm trying to pressure you or anything because i know that you don't like pressure i was like okay that's fine and, and i and it all not like i, I say disappeared i don't mean I, I suddenly was like okay let's just crack on with happy life then but I, I just felt like a big weight had been lifted and I felt good knowing that I did have a solution there if I want to take that solution. But at the minute, I know that I don't want to take that solution right now. Right now, I'm happy just enjoying my baby girl. But knowing that that solution's there in 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, we'll cross that bridge, basically, but when we come to it. Can't yet, anyway. Yeah, you've got to wait at least 10 weeks, we've been told. But, you know, who knows? In t when I get in 10 weeks, what's that's another th five weeks' time. Who knows how I'll feel back? Who knows how I'll feel then? You know, every day I feel differently. And I don't mean every day I feel differently in the respect that one day I don't want them doing. I don't mean that. I just mean it's not so heavy on me. So that's that. I just said I'm really quickly going to touch now. I'm sure I've just talked about it for 10 minutes solid. So I put a question on Instagram, a little question box up. I wasn't actually expecting such a wide range of questions, but um, lots of people have asked a few questions that I've already been vlogged about. So one here, don't want to be rude, but why did you have a cesarean section? There is a whole vlog on that on our channel, so I won't go over all of that um, again here. 
Um, why did you pick Aurora's name? If you go to the name reveal vlog, there's also everything explained there on why we chose Aurora's name. Loads of people are asking how Mila is with a baby. If I can insert a little video here, I will. I need to crop it because it's not appropriate to put online on the whole video. But if I can crop the bottom half, if I can crop the video, then I'll insert it. But if not, I'm just gonna give you a quick, she is just so obsessed. She loves the baby so much. Her and Jace run up to her all the time and <laughs> baby, 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 baby. And they're always asking to hold her. They hold her multiple times a day. Um, they're not over they're sometimes a little bit overwhelming because they like to get right in her face, both of them. So they're all three of the heads are like crushed together. I'm like, whoa, be careful. Um, but they're not overwhelming the fact that they're constantly on her. Like they do play and still obviously get on with their everyday activities, but there's no jealousy whatsoever and they just, they literally just adore her so much. I'm actually really excited for them to like, I'm not wishing any days away, but I am excited for seeing another little trio running around together because Jace and Mila are like, they're just the best of friends. It's just, it's so heartwarming to watch Jace and Mila because they just adore each other so much and they play together all day and it's just so lovely and I'm just kind of excited to see how that will be when Aurora's also able to run around and play with them. Someone's also asked if I homeschool my children as they are considering doing it with theirs. I will do a homeschooling vlog, I think, soon because I've got loads of questions about this recently. I honestly feel like homeschooling is on the rise. The amount of messages I got, the amount of messages I get now about homeschooling is through the roof, through the roof daily. Um, just asking for advice and saying that you want to take your children out, asking what resources we use, things like that. So I probably will do a home, we do homeschool, yes. And I'll probably do an update on that um, very, very soon because I do get that asked all the time. There's been a few questions, I've just noticed one question pop up saying, does Aurora have a nickname like your other children? So she does, her nickname is Aura. There's been a few questions asking, is her name Aurora or is it Aura? I keep say, I keep hearing you say both. Again, watch her name reveal and that's all explained on there. I'll leave it down below. There's been quite a few um, questions about um, Aurora's blood test. Can you tell me? Oh, the gender. Could you tell me what company you use for Aurora's gender blood test, please? So we used a company called Sneak Peek. We also used it with, no, we didn't. It's the first time we've used it. It's Katrina we used it with. My sister used it. We didn't use it with our previous two children because we had the NIPT test, which um, included the gender at the same age, same gestation as what the Sneak Peek's used from. So the Sneak Peek blood test, I'm pretty sure you can use it from six weeks pregnant. It's actually crazy how early you can find out the gender of your baby. And it's really, really cool. It, it, it looks for the Y chromosome in your blood, basically, because only males carry that chromosome. And if you have the Y picked up in your blood, then that means you're carrying a boy. And if there's no Y chromosome there, then obviously that means you're carrying a girl. So sneak peek is the one that we get we used. I know that some people have said that it was wrong for them. Um, it's such a hard test to do. You have to make, especially if you've got boys in the house or your partner's in the house, you have to properly clean, sterile all the surfaces because it's really easy to pick up their DNA if you don't do that. But it's always been right for us via blood test. Um, the NIPT test works in the exact same way. So it's looking for the Y chromosome. If that's in your body at all, it's obviously not from you because you're not male. So that would mean you're carrying a boy. I definitely recommend it. Um, we really enjoyed finding out the gender of our last three babies. Our first three babies were all surprises. And I kind of low-key feel like I, prefer I preferred finding... I'm going to annoy people now. Sarah, stop okay. saying things like low-key. You know, it's really... <laughs> it's another one of those things that grates on me, right? Out. I liked being able to prepare. I liked being able to pick a name. I liked being able, I felt like I bonded more with my pregnant belly, knowing the gender and knowing what they'd be called. I really don't like that, Sarah. You bonded more with your pregnant belly, knowing the the gender and what they'll be called, <laughs> aside from the fact you didn't know what they were going to be called until about 10 days after she was actually born. But, you know, that kind of suggests that you wouldn't bond with your baby 
whilst you know if you didn't know the gender and i feel like that's quite wrong etc and then i think this is a super long video so i'm going to end it by answering this last question did you want a big family when you were younger i just have always wondered no i didn't i did not want a big family when i was young in fact i always said i'd just have two children and funnily enough like i said about the tubes tying doing things for other people. I've always said after every one of my children, this is the last one with Isabel, I did it. And she was only my first baby. So we'd often, I think it's just like one of those questions that everyone asks when you've had a baby, are you having any more? And even with Isabel, I have never had the guts to say, yeah, we might have one more. I don't know why. I don't know why I've never had the guts to say it ever. Um, and I've always felt like I need to say, no, nope, definitely not having no more. I've always felt like that, even with Isabel. So when I had Isabel and people would ask, I'm like, nope, she's going to be an only child. And then when we had Esme, nope, just having these two. And then we had Isla. It's always been the same. I don't know why I have this negative spin on saying, yeah, we might have another child. Like, I feel really naughty saying that. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and I didn't want a big family. We got the three girls. Um... Me and Chris did always say that it would be so lovely to have three girls when we first got together and we were so lucky and fortunate enough to be able to do that quite quickly and easily. Um, and then we were done and I feel like we were done for society. Um, like I say, I never felt like I could say we'd have any more. But at the time it was definitely the right choice for us because our situation... We couldn't financially afford to have more children, not in the respect that, and I sometimes feel like this is where people forget, not in the respect that I couldn't afford nappies or we wouldn't be able to feed them or we might not get a holiday each year. It wasn't that. It was more we couldn't afford a new car, um, a bigger car, because obviously when you go from three to four children, you can't have a regular five five seat car. We were in a three bedroomed house and you know, I feel like obviously me and Chris took up one of those rooms and if we would have had a boy, then that would have meant all three girls sharing and the rooms weren't very big and we weren't our own house, we were renting um, and I just didn't feel like we'd have fit into that house. And One of the rooms being, not being big and the space not being big is a, is a benchmark. Why the hell do you keep having more kids when you spend most of your life in a van that is very, very much smaller than your original house? It was more that we couldn't afford it aspect side. And then obviously I've always said the biggest the biggest gift that YouTube and you guys watching these videos has given us is our children, our our three I can't believe we've got three more children. Um is Jace, Mila and Aurora. Because if YouTube hadn't have taken off and our financial situation didn't change, then we would not have been in a position to have more children. Um and then suddenly Suddenly, I just craved a big family and I just wanted to have a big family and it was a really weird feeling. When I had Isabel, Esme and Isla and people say having more and I'd reply straight away with no, we're not having any more. I don't know if that's because I'd, I genuinely felt like I didn't want more, but I don't know if I was, if that was, I was subconsciously saying that because I felt like I'd conditioned my own mind that that was the right thing to say. I did genuinely feel like that. I wasn't like lying when I was saying it. But I don't know if that's because I was sub... I don't know if I'm making sense here. I don't know if that's because I was subconsciously telling myself this is the right decision rather than actually thinking about what do I actually want. Because when I had Jace, when I gave birth, birth to Jace very quickly afterwards, weeks, he was like weeks old, um... Whilst people would say, is he your last? And I'd say, yeah, he's definitely the last. I knew and I didn't. I said to one of my friends at the time, I, I know he's not my last. I could literally have 10 more babies right now. Like he was only a couple of weeks old and I wanted another baby straight away with him. And then that kind of, as he got a little bit older, I kind of thought, mm, is that the right decision? I'm not too sure actually. And then he got over a year old and I was like, oh, maybe, maybe he should be the last. Um, so obviously then Chris was start, starting to say, should we have another one so that Jason's got a playmate? And I was like, no, no. But was it because I'm conditioned my own mind to think that that was because that's what I should be saying? Because then obviously I, I did want Mila and I got pregnant with Mila. 
and I and then I did want Aurora and I got pregnant quickly with Aurora. Um and now I could I feel like now this is that this is why I feel so different and it's so weird to me and such a bizarre feeling. Because now I feel like I could have ten children and be completely content and happy. And I've always told myself, no, I want a small family, I don't want a big family. But now I feel like I don't know if it's because I'm older and I'm more mature and I feel like I'm a different parent and no better and no worse, but just a different parent now. I just, I feel different in myself with regards to being a mother. And I don't feel like I have to keep saying no, I'm, or being embarrassed that I've got a big family. Like I feel proud of my family. I feel so proud that I've got six children. And I feel, I don't know, it's really weird feeling. I don't know if it's because I had this tube tying thing has just made me realize like what's important like why are you so worried about other people why are you so bothered about what trolls say why are you so bothered about what strangers and people other people say and it's just made me feel so much stronger and so I feel just so much prouder to have a big family now and you know when when people have been around and midwives and things and I've spoken to them about how I feel and they're like is this your last one I'm like yeah probably but, but who knows maybe not and it's just been really it's been really, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uplifting, liberating. liberating to say that, yeah. That's exactly it, because I never felt like I could say that before. And now, even though Aurora might be our last, I still, I st I still want to say, no, she's not our last. Just because I feel like I can. <laughs> it's so, such a weird feeling. I didn't always want a big family. But maybe I did. And maybe I was just too much worried about what society thinks about large families. Maybe I did always want a big family, I don't know. Maybe just as I've got older, I've realised, listen to yourself. Don't listen to what other people want. Maybe it's that. Anyway, I'm ending that on that note. So, uh, Think that's, that's baby number seven, then. <laughs> Summer 24, definitely not. That's a bit too soon. Think about what you want, IFAM. Don't let other people influence you. I have let other people influence me to a huge extent, and I didn't even realise it. And that is not a lie, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. But people have influenced me my whole life. I always care about what other people think. And I'm at a stage in my life now at the grand old ripe age of 37 where I don't give two Fs about what Tracy down the road thinks. Um, that's a made up name. There is no Tracy down the road. I don't care what anyone else thinks about me, my family, how many children I have, whether I want more children, whether I don't want more children. And it genuinely took changing my own body for someone else to realise that. Don't let that be you. If you want your tubes tied and it's a decision you've made and you definitely want, go ahead and do it. If you want 20 children, go ahead and do it. Don't listen to society. Don't listen to strangers. Don't listen to people, family, friends who think it's okay to put pressure on you about something that actually has absolutely no relevance on their life. Do what you want to do, you and your family. And I'm ending that on that note. So thank you all so much for watching this little vlog video. You're welcome, Sarah. It was a delight as usual. It was a fantastic vlog. You know, I found out some very interesting things and some things that I'm sure are going to be mentioned over and over and over again because you just came across a little bit silly during... And as I said earlier, that I literally felt stupider for listening to your crap. Honestly, it just made my, my head spin a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but everybody else, if you've enjoyed this video, if you've managed to make it to the end, thank you so much. Please give it a massive thumbs up. Comment all your thoughts about it down below as usual and subscribe to the channel if you're new because these things take effort, you know, these videos. If you want more of them, subscribe and I'll know that you'll want more. Until next time, take care of yourselves and bye-bye.